Welcome everyone to Find Your Fit, your U.S. study options. Today's presentation is going to be about your step one to U.S. study um, and how to narrow down your search. I want to just say happy International Women's Day. Um, it's a, a day to, to celebrate women's accomplishments. And I'm so excited that as part of today's session, we will also have a women's college with us, which I think really will emphasize uh, today's celebrations. Education USA is a US Department of State network of more than 400 international student advising centers in more than 170 countries. The network promotes US higher education to students around the world by offering accurate, comprehensive, and current information about opportunities to study at accredited post-secondary institutions in the United States. You can learn more about our network at educationusa.state.gov. We have three Education USA advisors here in Canada, and we're all here today. Uh, my name is Jenica Heim. I'm based in Ottawa, and I support students across Eastern Canada. Um, and you can see on the right hand side there my email address. Uh, next up, Hung. Hello, everybody. My name is Hung Lu, and I'm your Education USA advisor in Toronto. I support uh, people in Ontario, excluding Ottawa region. I'll pass it to Zhao Ying. Hi, everyone. My name is Zhao Ying. If you are from one of the provinces west of Ontario, I will be your advisor. Uh, please feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions. And back to Jenica. Thank you both. And if you want to jump off camera, you can do that. Um, and so Hung and Zhao Ying are here for the whole session as am I. If you have questions and you're from there, you know, whatever region you're from, feel free to use the private chat and just send a quick introduction or whatever questions you have about studying in the States. Education USA has a lot of free uh, resources. We provide free advising to students and we have really great events. So this is the first webinar of a series that we're calling Prepare for the Fair. Um, all of our Prepare for the Fair webinars are step one webinars, um, meaning that they're about narrowing your search. Our next one's going to be on March 22nd. So if you're interested in that particular uh, event, there is a pop-up. Oh, I will do it later because I'm not sure where it is in this new platform, but there is a way that you can register for that event and I will bring that up in a minute. Um, and then our fair itself is going to take place in May. Um, so please jot down which uh, location is going to be nearest to you. Um, we will have more than 50 US universities that you can speak to and learn more about their programs. So definitely uh, mark your calendar and the registration will be coming out soon. I'm going to start with a brief overview of what narrowing your search is and what you should be looking for when you are searching for U.S. universities. Um, so these are five steps to U.S. study, and all of these webinars are really going to concentrate on that first step. There are more than 4,700 universities and colleges in the United States. That number can feel very overwhelming, but it can also be very, very exciting because it means that there are a lot of options when it comes to studying in the U.S. Canada has about 100 universities, about 150 colleges. And so while there's a lot of great institutions out there, there's just not as much variety. And so what you find in the United States is that when you're looking for study options, it's not just about narrowing things based on your academic profile as well as the major you want to study. Um, sometimes if you just look at those two things, your list still might have hundreds, if not thousands of universities or colleges on it. So you have to take other things into consideration, such as where is the institution located? Is it in a big city, a small rural location, close to home, far from home? The size of the campus? Is it is it uh, big with a lot of undergraduate uh, and graduate programs? Is it a smaller campus with more uh, focus on a smaller number of majors? What type of institution is it? And that's really what today's webinar is going to be about, is diving into different types of institutions. And uh, the next webinar that we're going to have is really about financial aid and 
looking into if financial aid is available is another way to help you narrow your search. And then another thing you can take into consideration are things like the campus life you'll experience and nearby activities. So what types of institutions are there? Uh, U.S. has both public and private institutions. Um, so you'll find that some are subsidized by the state. That's a public institution. And some are, uh, are not. At a private university, you would have the tuition be more uh, equal for international students and in-state students. Whereas at a public institution, in-state students will pay less money. So those will be students who are from that state. Um, so there can be a lot of similarities between public and private institutions. And you'll hear a little bit today from both different types. There's different focuses for institutions, uh, the broad categories. And some of these, you know, some institutions might consider that they are more than one of these. Um, but research in institutions or universities, um, which typically have graduate level and, and um, PhD programs as well as undergraduate. Regional universities, meaning uh, ones that focus a little more on their local population. Liberal arts colleges, smaller institutions, which focus a lot on their bachelor level degrees or undergraduate degrees and tend to um, really emphasize a broader breadth of study. Technical or arts institutions, um, special focus, which could be something like a arts conservatory, and then two-year colleges. And we have a two-year college here today who will tell you more about what that is. On top of have like an actual type of university, the university or college might have a special mission or special focus. So the main ones that you'll come across in the United States are religiously affiliated uh, universities, and there's all different types of religions. Um, the, the ones that you're going to come across most frequently are Christian, um, Catholic, um, Jewish, Mormon, um, so there's a lot of different options in the U.S. And then, of course, there's different denominations, particularly under Christian. There's a lot of different denominations. And those will all be um, private universities. There are single gender institutions. We have one here today, Spellman, who will talk more about that. Um, there are men's only and women's only colleges in the U.S. There are only, I think, three or four men's only colleges. And there's uh, far more women's only colleges, a lot more options there. Uh, and then minority serving institutions. So there are four main categories of minority serving institutions, historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institutions. And we have people from institutions, these three categories today. So I'll let them speak more about that. And then the last one's tribal colleges and universities. And those ones are institutions that really focus on supporting Native American students and tend to be either on or directly related to reservations in the United States. These are our panelists that we have with us today who are really going to help explain the breadth of institutions that we have in the United States, as well as giving you some examples through their own institutions. Um, so our panelists are Frank Jurovic from St. Petersburg College, Mikhail Estride from Spelman College, Scott Travis from Kettering University, and Laura Gale from University of California, Santa Cruz. So up first, we have uh, Frank from St. Petersburg College to tell you a little bit more about community colleges and their benefits. Thank you very much, Jenica. A lot of lot to cover. You know, there's lots of various schools here. So I think it's very important that it's great that, you, that everyone's on the phone, on the call here, uh, the research in this stuff. You might hear two plus two. Two plus two is a common thing with uh, community colleges. But what's happening is a lot of community colleges are now offering bachelor's degrees. So what is a community college or what we call in Florida state college, junior college, you'll hear different names. Most of them are all going to have open admissions. So you don't have to have, you know, a high GPA, SAT scores, things like that. A lot of them are going to have English uh, classes as well. Obviously, it's not going to compare to you, but a lot of them um, housing can be challenging as well. You're going to have some of them have housing, some don't, some have apartments across the street. So you're going to have a variety of stuff, but it gives you a lot of flexibility with housing. There, a lot of them are not going to require to have housing at their campus. You can uh, choose to have an apartment first year. 
So that's a nice opportunity for students to look at community colleges. Mostly two-year degrees are offered there. Most of the community colleges or state colleges or junior colleges are going to have two-year degrees. So that's the focus. But a lot of them are starting to offer bachelor's degrees. For example, St. Petersburg College has had bachelor's degrees for over 20 years. We have over a dozen bachelor's degrees. Um, not a lot, but it's enough. A lot of students are business, common or nursing, things like that. There's 936 community colleges in the uh, uh, United States, a lot. Over 8 million students attending these and lots of degree options. You have lots of everything from engineering to music to nursing. So lots of different opportunities. So what is a two plus two? Have you ever heard of two plus two? Well, you're basically taking two years at a community college or, and you're basically adding two years at a university. Now what's happening is a lot of times you can do all four years at a community college, which, for example, at St. Petersburg College, we have a bachelor's degree in business. So you may want to stay there and get a bachelor's degree. The reason why we call it two plus two is because your credits will count the same at a community college as they will at a state university. They're both public and they both have to follow the same rules as far as classes, credentialing and making sure that your credits are going to count. So, for example, in Florida, you can transfer from a community college, you get your two years or associate's degree. And if you decide, hey, I want to go to a big university because there's a special program in STEM or something. They will accept all your credits in an associate degree. There is an agreement. And this is common in California and a lot of places throughout the United States. So that's the great thing about community colleges. So you might ask, well, what kind of fields can I attend or participate in or uh, you know, seek a degree in and, and at a community college? Well, here's just a list of a, a variety of uh, op options you have. Arts and Humanities. We have a great music program. If you want to be a singer or the person that's actually using the soundboard, and making the CDs or beats and things like that. You can do that. Engineering, communications, marketing, all those things. Uh, technology, we have cybersecurity, which is a very hot one right now, hot topic. Uh, you know, engineering, we have different types of things like that. So lots of different options. We even have, uh, if you want to be a paralegal or if you want to go into uh, law later, um, or if you want to become a nurse or doctor you can, or uh, MSN or do something higher, you can do our bachelor's in biology and then apply for a medical uh, school as well. So lots of options. But what you're going to see mostly is 90% or 85% you're going to see is mainly associate's degrees with a few bachelor's degrees sprinkled in. So what does it look like? What does a community college look like? Well, we have sports. Most of them are going to have sports. They compete at a at the junior college. I can tell you in Florida, it's very competitive. Uh, we have lots of students. Um, some of you might have heard of the Toronto Blue Jays. They practice. They are here right now practicing about 10 minutes from our campus, from one of our campuses. They practice in Dunedin, which is, uh, like I said, a few minutes from our campus. I go there usually one or two games a year, so it's a great – they just redid it, so it's a beautiful facility. But we have all those things. So we have sports. We have a mascot. You know, We have clubs, over 100 clubs, all those things you would see at a university. So very similar in that way. So why do a lot of students pick community colleges? Well, it's very, a lot of them are very successful. You know, over 90% of our students pass their classes, international students, free tutors. And what that means is there are people full-time that tutor. That's all they do for their job is tutor people, tutor students all the time. So that's awesome. They're there 40 hours a week, just like a regular work week. And they're there all, all day and they'll tutor you in math, science, whatever you need. We also have a lot of community colleges have guaranteed transfers. What that means is as soon as you finish your associates, you're guaranteed, for example, we have the University of South Florida, which is a traditional big university. Our tuition price is about half, but you can come to school with us for two years. And if you want to transfer to a degree, you can do that. Or we have also another example is at Florida A&M, which is a historical black university. We have an uh, a automatic transfer into that school as well. As I mentioned, it's about half price in a state university. Lots of scholarships available. We have all kinds of ones available. Many locations. So we're spread out. We're five minutes from the beach. So we're very close to the water, main location, small class sizes. That's another huge one, about 20 or 25 students in a class. It's great. You can actually talk to your professor and go up after class opportunities for work. A lot of you might know, but you might've heard of OPT that is available after your bachelor's, but a lot of students don't realize you can work for up to one year after you receive your two year associate's degree. So that's something that's appealing to you. You can do an associate's do two years and work for one year and then come back for your bachelor's and then work for another year. So that's a great opportunity to do that. We have payment plans. So if you're looking at two semesters, it's less than $10,000 for tuition. You can pay multiple times during the year as a payment plan. Lots of scholarships. We gave away almost $5 million just to our students in scholarships uh, college-wide. 
you can see the cost uh, comparable to uh, other universities locally. So a lot, a lot less money. So where are we located? We're located right there in Florida, almost directly down, straight down from Toronto uh, area. We see we're a little finger, we're a peninsula, so we're surrounded by water almost uh, on all sides. You know, beautiful white beaches. Many of you probably heard we have lots of Canadians down here that uh, come uh, for the winter time. So very a lot of direct flights from Tampa, uh, WestJet flies here and things like that from Toronto, and, and lots of options for that. We are the sunshine sunshine city, so we're basically sunshine is here almost every day of the year. Those are some pictures from our area. There, we're about ninety minutes from Mickey Mouse uh, Disney World. So um, we also have right now, we actually have right now, we just had a huge number of students come in. So we have closer to 200 international students from actually about 65 countries. So it's large. We're the oldest community college in Florida. This is one of our newer buildings that just opened up. Um, so what I'm just, I want to leave you guys with it is please research your options. You know, you'll hear about all these different schools, but pick the college or school or university that is best for you. So if you're looking at budget, maybe you're looking at flights, maybe you're looking at weather, if you want something warm, it never gets below um, 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit here in, in, the, in our area. So jackets are very minimal for us. It's cold for you. Probably not, but just do your research when you're looking at different schools and pick the best one for you. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm the director of, uh, of um, international programs for the whole college. So I will reply to you and, and hopefully uh, steer you in the right direction. Thank you so much, Frank, for that information. So what you all have probably seen is that at the end of the presentation, I put out a poll asking if you'd like to receive follow-up information from that college, so um, from St. Petersburg. So if you would like Frank to send you a follow-up email, go ahead and click yes on that message. Um, so that was a little bit about two-year colleges and the benefits they have. Um, the uh, next three institutions will all be uh, four-year universities. And I'm going to pass it off to Mikhail from Spelman. Thank you, Jenica. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, my name is Miss Mikhail Aristide. I serve as one of the admissions counselors in the Office of Admissions here at Spelman College, and I also have the pleasure of working with international populations. I was an international student um, when I was coming into college, so I definitely um, have a heart for you all as interna potential international students. Um, so with that, let's get started and talk about Spelman. So Spelman College is an all-women's and an HBCU. Um, so I want to take some time and just talk through what an HBCU is, what a women's college is, and then where Spelman fits into this picture as uh, holding both of these identities. So going into an HBCU, so HBCU is a historically Black college or university. Uh, the first HBCU was actually founded in 1837. Spelman specifically, we were founded in 1881, so a couple of years after that. Um, but it actually took until 1960 for the first, uh, or for all of the HBCUs that already were founded um, to be recognized and accredited by the U.S. Department of, uh, of Education. So this is huge um, when it comes to the history of HBCU. So it's important to understand that while we were founded in 1881 and the very first HBCU was founded in 18, 1837, it took another 100 plus years for the United States to accredit um, and to give value <laughs> so to speak, to these degrees. So even if you did hold a bachelor's degree from Spelman prior to 1964, essentially um, in the United States, that did not mean anything up until it was accredited. Um, currently, we have over a, or just about 107 different HBCUs nationwide, which represent about 3% of colleges and universities in the United States. Um, the mission of HBCU, so again, an HBCU is a historically black college or university. Um, the primary mission was to really uh, create a safe space for African Americans um, to be able to receive an education following the Civil War. So going into history, um, black students were not able to uh, enter colleges or universities that were not HBCUs. So this was in in it of itself was a safe space to educate and to uh, train African-Americans to become quote unquote productive citizens. So that's how we started. This is a safe space for students of color, for black students specifically. Um, but over the time, HBCUs have really taken um, a hold of the economy. So there is a huge impact. So just looking at the numbers, so HBCUs overall in the United States uh, will uh, create about 134,000 jobs uh, in a given year. 
They contribute about $14.8 billion uh, U.S. dollars in economic impact and then ultimately $130 billion in lifetime earnings. So uh, while we are small by mighty, so only 107 of us um, currently, which represent only 3% of the population, but about 30% of Black uh, of African Americans did graduate from an HBCU. So there is a lot to who we are, and this is a quick session, so I will not go into too, too much depth about HBCUs. Um, but again, just the importance of HBCUs, um, the benefits that you can attend, that you get from attending an HBCU is the prestige and pride. So it's a family-like environment. Um, as Black uh, individuals, we love a good uh, family. So everybody is your aunt, your aunt, your aunt and uncle, your sister and your brother. So that is definitely something that translates to when it comes to the HBCU uh, environment. That will look a lot of different ways. So yes, the family-like environment, but a lot of mentorship is also created out of this. So your staff, your professors and the staff and faculty um, really do become uh, those older siblings, but are really looking out for you and want you to be successful. So they will put you into contact with their networks and they will make sure that you are showing up to class. They will email you. They will text you sometimes to make sure um, that you are okay and that you are doing what you need to do in order to be successful, both while in college, but also once you have graduated. Um, the last aspect is the alumni network that you get out of an HBCU. This is, we are notorious for, um, uh, for giving a strong alumni network. So students at Spelman will also, we always speak about the sisterhood. So your older sisters are constantly looking out and sharing internship and job opportunities. So this is definitely a huge benefit of attending an HBCU. And then last but not least, uh, the safety aspect that is given in HBCUs. This is a safe space that was created for black people. So this is an environment where you really are able to let your guard down and focus on who you are as an individual outside of your racial identity, but ultimately learn how to use your racial identity Identity in order to prosper and to grow as a person and to be the best version of yourself. Um, so this is definitely um, an important aspect that you can only get at an HBCU. It is a safe space that was created for you um, and is continued by you. Now shifting into the history of women's colleges, as I mentioned, Spelman is a women's college. So a little bit of history. So for the first women's college was actually founded in 1836. So just a year prior to HBCUs. In, 19, in 1979, uh, the, women's coalition, uh, the Women's College Coalition or WCC was founded, which was a coalition of all the women's colleges. And around 1960, um, there was give or take about 230 different women co women's colleges in the United States and Canada. However, we have actually, contrary to HBCUs, we've seen a drastic shift. So while HBCUs were not that many uh, when they started to be, when they when the first one was founded, and ultimately we have 107 with women's colleges, we started with about 200 and 230, and today there's actually 40, only 47 women's colleges left in the United States and Canada. In the United States specifically, I believe it's about 35 to 36, um, the most recent statistics. So there has definitely been a decrease in women's colleges, but there are a lot of benefits of attending a women's college. So at a women's college, some of the uh, highlights that you can receive out of a women's college is the community environment. So the sisterhood is what you will hear a lot of at a women's college. This is important. Um, Today is International Women's uh, Day, so this is definitely a day where we highlight the women's experience, but this is all around. This is happening all year around at Women's College. This is an environment where you will be the majority, um, unlike a lot of other colleges and universities where you may be a minority. You will also learn to be a leader. Um, so if you're not already a leader, um, you will learn how to be a leader, and if you were a leader, how to heighten and become a better leader. Similarly to HBCUs, um, um, alumni networks are very strong at alumni at uh, all women's colleges as well. So again, looking out for one another is definitely common within a women's college experience, as well as traditions, rich in traditions. A picture here that you can see is the arch at Spelman. This is notorious. Um, this symbolizes the transition from a uh, Spelmanite, which is a current Spelman student, into a Spelman woman. So once they have graduated, this is a, a arch that is so sacred that students, before they graduate, do not walk under. They will not cross or touch until that class day of their senior year when they are um, being welcomed into the alumni hood. And you can see behind their uh, fellow sisters are welcoming them into the alumni network. And then, of course, at a women's college, a lot of outcomes and achievements. So really honing in on that women's experience, learning to be a minority and learning to use your mind, your marginalized identity um, as a strength rather than a weakness. 
So that brings us to Spelman College. Again, we are an HBCU. We're also a women's college. We have been ranked the number one HBCU for now 16 years consecutively. And we're also a global leader in the education of women of African descent. You do not have to identify as a Black person to attend an HBCU. However, this is the environment that was created for Black people. So we do see specifically at Spelman that most of our students do have some sort of relation or affinity towards uh, being uh, Black. The other aspect, and I believe we have a liberal arts institution, so I won't touch too much on this, but we are also a liberal arts institution and we're ranked the number, number 57 uh, top liberal arts institution. So focusing on the whole person, um, we see at Spelman as free thinking. So connecting all of these pieces of your identity. So uh, most of our students are black women. So empowering black women, encouraging them to be the best version of themselves so that once they graduate, they are trailblazing individuals um, and can walk into a space and really truly come command it. And then lastly, this is a QR code for you all to scan out. If you want to get my contact information, again, my name is Mikael Aristide. I am the admissions counselor over international populations. If you scan this QR code, you'll be able to uh, go through our website and hyperlink is my email. So you can definitely send me an email if you have any questions or concerns about attending an HBCU, an all women's college, about Spelman specifically, I'm happy to help in any way, shape and form that I can. Also, I encourage you to follow us on Instagram and TikTok. We are really um, uh, getting up there on TikTok to learn more about that student experience. Again, this is a very unique experience that you can get at Spelman. We are one of two all women's and HBCU. So we it's Spelman College and Bennett College in North Carolina. So there's only two of us that have really focused in on what it is to be a Black woman. So I encourage you all to ask any questions. And at this time, I will pass it back over to Jenica. Thank you so much, Mikhail. So if you are interested in learning more about Spelman, please uh, click yes on the poll. As a reminder, as a women's only college, um, that might uh, filter some of our crowd out. Um, so uh, if you are not woman identifying, then uh, you will likely click no on that particular poll. Um, so I, go, I went ahead and put that one up. So please answer that poll and Mikhail will get back to you. I want you to also notice that in the handout section, we have links to each of the universities, as well as a couple of handouts from Education USA that can really support you through this particular step. Um, as we go along, feel free to ask questions either in the in the Q&A area or in the chat. We will do a robust question section uh, at the end here. So please feel free to interact. Um, you may also use the private chat to ask individual questions to the admissions officers if you have them. Uh, with that, we're going to move along to our third uh, institution, uh, Kettering University. So uh, Scott, go ahead and join us on camera. Hello, everybody. My name is Scott Travis. Um, I'm uh, the Director of Graduate and International Admissions at Kettering University. And uh, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about our institution. Um, but first, I'm going to kind of introduce a couple of concepts that you'll hear along the way in your college search. I first wanted to, um, to talk about STEM universities. So STEM, um, as many of you know, uh, you know, the laboratory and computer sciences, of course, uh, technology and engineering, and then the illustrious M, which can mean a number of different things, right? So math, medicine, management, um, some of those other acronyms um, get related to that as well. But STEM from a U.S. university means a couple of different things as well. Some universities that describe themselves as STEM universities, they really have a, uh, in many cases, they have a focus um, or a few departments that are, that are quite reputable. Um, but their STEM uh, education is really built on a liberal arts base. Um, other universities, uh, and this includes Kettering, they are officially designated as STEM universities. And what that means, you have to do a little digging to figure out whether students are, are officially designated. Um, but in these cases, they require 50% fewer general education requirements. So the gen eds are a little bit uh, fewer in number, um, meant for students that are um, really interested in uh, a, a real focus um, on the STEM disciplines and wanna get started in their freshman year 
and maybe you're looking for a little bit less of a rounded education, certainly less of a liberal arts education, um, and want to dive right in. Sometimes universities in the United States uh, might be designated as engineering colleges or engineering universities. They can be called tech institutes or technical institutes. In some cases, they'll use the term polytechnic, all in their titles. But in many cases, um, uh, STEM universities don't have any of these, these attributes in their titles. Kettering University is, a, is an officially designated STEM university, but obviously we don't have tech or polytech in our name. Um, so kind of referring to, um, to, to the STEM curriculum, many schools, many STEM schools also incorporate a lot of application uh, in, their, in their curriculum. So it can be research on campus, a lot of laboratory and workshop space in many cases that has corporate or government, some sort of grant funding to help support STEM research. And in many cases, this research uh, certainly involves the faculty members. Um, many cases, most often involves graduate students. And in some cases, again, do your research. Uh, sometimes they can pull undergraduates into the research facets as well. So that's something to look into in, in all these different STEM universities is you, as an incoming undergraduate student, what will you have access to as far as labs and facilities on campus and faculty that have specific research endeavors? How do you get involved? In some cases, students that just express um, a certain amount of initiative, personal initiative, they're the ones that get rewarded. So keep that, uh, keep that in mind, even as you're starting your freshman year. In many cases, um, colleges, STEM colleges, will talk about uh, internship opportunities as well. Internships are often short-term. Uh, they're often part-time or volunteer experiences, and they're rarely mandatory. In other words, they're not necessarily a graduation requirement. Uh, in many cases, students are, are left up to their own initiative to explore these opportunities. Many cases, universities provide resources to help um, but internships are relatively lightweight compared to the other end of that same work experience spectrum, which is the co-op experience. So think of a co-op, if you hear that term, a co-op is really kind of a more intensive um, internship. So it's usually longer in duration, often repeats. Uh, most universities, they'll get started maybe sophomore, maybe junior year. In some cases, co-ops are required, for example, for some departments like engineering departments. Um, and for example, in some universities, all engineering students at that university are gonna start a co-op in their junior year. Um, at Kettering University, 100% of our students co-op and all of them start freshman year. So that's unique uh, and I'll dive into that in a minute. So, how co-ops and internships are folded into a degree program uh, also affects visa regulations. So that's case by case by university. Um, there's CPT options available. What that means is curricular practical training. What that means is internships built into um, a curriculum uh, during, the, uh, during your schooling. And then there's OPT options. So OPT is optional practical training post-graduation. So what you're offered uh, under a visa, your student visa, what you can continue to do in the United States in, in, uh, in once you finish your degree. So Kettering University, along with other officially designated STEM universities, ha can offer three years of OPT. Uh, but it really varies from school to school. So into some details about Kettering specifically, we're located in Michigan. Um, much like Florida, we, uh, we are um, surrounded by water, <laughs> but they're the Great Lakes. So a little cooler and certainly not far from, uh, from Canada, just right across the border. So we're very proud of our campus. We're a relatively small school. We have about uh, 2,000 students total um, in Flint, Michigan, just north of Detroit. Flint and Detroit, of course, are the birthplace of the automotive industry, which is where we got our start back in 1919. We've been in partnership with the automotive industry in particular for over 100 years now. And a lot of our campus facilities reflect some of the things that I talked about 
um, with STEM universities. We have a lot of hands-on facilities, a lot of laboratory space. We try to minimize uh, the amount of, st of, of time students spend in lecture halls and auditoriums and really try to get them into a kind of a hands-on experience where they're rolling up their sleeves and, and getting involved in uh, these projects. We have our own proving grounds in the upper left. Uh, we're very involved in robotics. Of course, the, the vehicle in the center of the picture is, uh, is actually an autonomous vehicle, self-driving vehicle. So we get very involved in, in hands-on projects too. Some of the undergraduate degrees that we offer, this is gonna be um, you know, a sampling of what you're gonna see at a lot of STEM universities. 90% uh, of the students at Kettering are studying engineering of some variety. Um, and in many cases, you know, it's engineering physics. And then even our business students uh, are really studying business in terms of supporting a STEM industry. So even their very kind of their bend is towards computer science and engineering applications. The co-op term that we have um, to give you a better idea of how Kettering does it, we alternate every other term. We have four academic terms per year and every other, we're just flip-flopping back and forth. That includes all of our international students as well, partnering with about 420 different companies um, and earning while they're doing it. So it's an opportunity to learn in the classroom and then directly in the very next term, applying that in a professional position, getting coached through that position and earning wages in that position. Um, like I said, we, we partner with a, a lot of different companies, a lot that, uh, that you'll recognize, but in many cases, they are um, business to business companies, companies that service some of, the, some of the brand names that you see on this slide. And they're located all over the world. So as a result, uh, between the, the extensive co-op program, the most extensive in the United States, and the very focused STEM degrees that we offer, the Wall Street Journal has us at number one in career preparation specifically, um, which is something that, that you may consider um, very strongly as, as you're looking at different colleges. So I hope that, uh, I hope that this, this helps kind of get a better idea of what STEM means and what a co-op or an internship can look like. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about Kettering, I just went ahead and put that poll up. And uh, anyone who clicks yes, Scott will follow up with you um, after, after our session. We have one more panelist. So, so far, hopefully you're, you've been seeing how different each university and institution is from one another. And we're going to go ahead and move to California for our final panelists. Uh, Laura, I will pass it to you. Thanks so much, Jonica. So, hello everyone. Nice to see you here. I'm Laura Gale. I am an international and non-resident specialist for the University of California, Santa Cruz. And I'm here to tell you a little bit more about public research universities and also um, introduce you to my campus, uh, UC Santa Cruz. It is the only UC that has both the beach, as you can see behind me, and the forest right here on campus. But first of all, we'll talk about the system. So the University of California is widely recognized as the leading public research university system in the entire world. And we do receive the most applications in the entire world. Here you see a screenshot of the UC application platform and all of the campuses that you have to choose from. And one of the really great things about applying to California's public a research university system is that you only have to fill out the application once and then you can submit your application to any of the campuses that you see here and um, apply up to um, nine campuses at um, the same time. As you can see my campus UC Santa Cruz is located in Northern California in the greater San Francisco Bay Area. So what does attending a public research university mean for you? UC Santa Cruz, as well as all of the other U University of California campuses, are tier one public research universities. What that means for you is that when you graduate from any of the UC campuses, your degree will have global recognition. I don't think there's a single employer in the entire world who has never heard of the University of California. So you can be sure that your bachelor's degree is going to be well recognized and everyone's going to see it as a sign of quality. Our reputation rests on the excellence of our faculty and our alumni. 
As you can see here, the University of California has 70 Nobel laureates on its faculty. And if you come to UC Santa Cruz in particular, you could end up studying with a Nobel laureate in medicine. Um, the photo on the upper left is of Dr. Carol Greider, who teaches in our molecular cell and developmental biology department. And she won the Nobel Prize for her research on telomeres, the ends of DNA strands that contribute to the genetic basis of disease. Dr. Greider's research is also a great example of the public element of University of California's mission. Our faculty, students, and alumni are working on discoveries and innovations to support the public good, to create progress for the people of California and for the entire world. So when you come to any campus of the University of California, you join in that greater mission. And next, we'll look at a brief introduction to my campus specifically, the University of California, Santa Cruz. Here you see some of our top majors. Um, since we are the closest University of California campus to Silicon Valley, we have very strong programs in technology related fields. Our most popular majors include computer science, computer engineering, and computer game design. We have a particular strength in game design. But many international students also come to UC Santa Cruz for our business management economics or our biological sciences programs as well as some of the other top programs, um, psychology, film and digital media, there are also very strong programs. UC Santa Cruz is the only University of California campus that was ranked in the top 10 for the quality of undergraduate teaching. We are a primarily undergraduate focused campus. So what we do really well is teaching undergraduates. And UC Santa Cruz is also one of the only UC campuses that offer scholarships to international students. Since we are a public university, unfortunately, we are not able to offer scholarships that cover the full cost of attendance for international students, but we do have the Dean's Award that can take up to $10,000 off your non-resident tuition. And um, lastly, uh, Canadian students in particular do appreciate our gorgeous, mild weather year round. At UC Santa Cruz, it's not only the faculty who conduct research and get involved in the public research university mission. In fact, 75% of undergraduates at UC Santa Cruz do research as well. And this is the great advantage of attending an R1 research university like UC Santa Cruz. You have the opportunity to get involved in cutting edge discoveries and add concrete professional skills to your resume as well as obtain high quality letters of recommendation from faculty members that can make really all the difference between um, getting into a fantastic graduate school or getting an internship or job of your choice. And our graduates have excellent career outcomes because of our stress on undergraduate research. UC Santa Cruz is also one of the very few R1 research universities that also is also a federally designated Hispanic serving institution. And we are dedicated to combining these missions. About 25% of our student body is Latina, Latino, Latinx. We want to ensure equity and educational outcomes and not just on the admissions side. So our aim is to support students of Hispanic origins to get involved in undergraduate research and to go on to top medical, law, and other graduate programs. We aim to create a pipeline for future academics and innovators of color. And the programs you see here assist Latinx students in getting admitted to graduate schools. And many of these programs come with scholarships of up to $6,000, along with career mentoring to ensure success. Additionally, UC Santa Cruz is also an Asian American and Native American Pacific Islander serving institution. About 30% of our students are of Asian descent and about 2% Native American or Pacific Islander. We have many services to support students of Asian descent, and that also includes Southwest Asia. Our Asian American Pacific Islander Resource Center serves students from South Asia, North Africa, and the Middle East, and they work with our student organizations, such as our Chinese Student Association, our Indian Student Association, or our Iranian Student Network to create community and organize celebrations like Holi, today is Holi, <laughs> as far as I know, um, and other um, cultural celebrations. So to conclude, if you are a student with family origins outside of Europe, you will find that you fit right in at UC Santa Cruz. About 70% of our students are students of color. And UC Santa Cruz would be a great fit for you if you are excited about making new discoveries and solving problems. 
here is a QR code to learn more information. Please do feel welcome to reach out to me if you have any questions about applying to UC Santa Cruz or just the UC system in general. Thanks very much for being here. Thank you Thank so you much, Laura. Laura. And I went ahead and put up the poll for uh, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, if you'd like to receive follow-up information from Laura um, about her campus. Um, one of my favorite mascots of any university, the banana slug. Um, they are real. <laughs> if you go to Santa Cruz, you will see banana slugs. Okay, so now is time for questions. I know you've all been quiet so far, but there's a lot of people here. So now get to your keyboard and start typing. Um, I'm going to ask all the panelists back on, and this is your opportunity to get perspectives from really different types of institutions. Hopefully you've learned through this presentation um, how how much of a variety we have in the United States. Um, while we're waiting for people to type in their questions, um, I'd love to ask a little bit about liberal arts um, and how they're done at your school. So I know at Scott, Scott, you mentioned like you're on the other end of things with STEM. So um, maybe this is more for Mikhail and for Laura. So tell me a little more about what it's like to do uh, liberal arts at a liberal arts college. And then Laura, maybe you can speak to what it's like at a research institution and how they tackle uh, liberal arts. Let's start with Mikhail. Sure. Um, so at a liberal arts institution, specifically at Spelman, we focus on free thinking. Um, so we really want our students to think beyond what they think are the norms and what makes sense. So connecting dots of things they may not think relate. So biology and the arts, for example, you don't think that those relate, but we want our students to dive into everything that they're passionate about. And we help them through conversations, through the classroom, specifically with their advisors, see how those two can connect and how they can put that to use in their professional careers. I will say also Spelman, I didn't mention this, but we are also research heavy. So about one in three of our students do um, engage in research and high level research across the discipline. So whether that is in STEM disciplines, um, in the arts or the humanities or social sciences, um, we definitely are present in the research field and encourage our students to engage. Um, and they can get started with research as early as their freshman year on campus. Yeah, so at UC Santa Cruz, uh, one of our other uh, things that's distinctive about, you, uh, about our institution is that we are a research university. So students here have access to um, world-class research facilities and faculty who are leading innovators in their fields. But as I mentioned before, we also stress undergraduate education. So what we try to provide is kind of like a combination between a liberal arts college experience and with, but within the context of a research university. One of the ways that we do that is through our college system, our residential college system. So all the students um, at UC Santa Cruz are affiliated with a residential college, and that provides them with a smaller scale environment, um, kind of like a home base, a home community, home neighborhood on campus. Um, but then they have access to all of the facilities at UC Santa Cruz to, to um, get involved in research. Thank you so much. All right, so we have a question about scholarships. So um, the first thing I'm gonna do is I am going to pop up the, um, the opportunity on our next webinar where we're gonna talk really in depth on financing studies. So please feel free to register for that to get a full hour on scholarships. Um, but I will throw it out to the group here. Does anyone have some tips on uh, Canadians or international students in general and um, searching for scholarships? Um, I'll just jump in here. We actually have a really cool thing called a linkage scholarship for Canadians. Uh, Florida offers that. Uh, it's really great. Basically, you can get it every semester um, and it offers in-state tuition. So, for example, your tuition would be like somewhere around you know, $1,100, 1100 US dollars every semester. And it's pretty, pretty open. It's, you just apply for it and have a decent GPA, nothing crazy. And you can apply for it. So I'll, maybe I'll pop a link in there as well. But that's a great opportunity if you're going to attend Florida uh, college in Florida. 
I'll speak generally to scholarships. I think just Googling, um, just with different identities that you hold. So scholarships for X major, scholarship for Canadians, for this country, for this race. Um, I think that's an easy way. And then also um, generally for employers, there might be some opportunities through your parents' employers that they have uh, funds available. Banks are also another um, care, another opportunity. Natural hair care products for HBCUs specifically offer scholarships. So really you just have to take the time. It's a nitty gritty process, but if you really want it, it's out there. You just have to be willing to put in the work um, to do some digging to be able to find them. And about UC Santa Cruz, uh, one of the great things about our UC application too is that it is your scholarship application at the same time. So you don't have to fill out a separate application. When you apply to UC Santa Cruz, you're going to be automatically considered for that undergraduate dean's award. Uh, so you don't have to do anything, any extra steps for that. Yeah, thanks for that, um, those tips from everybody. And so um, to Laura's point, that's really typical uh, in the United States, especially as an international student. There's usually not another scholarship application to fill out. You will, your application is extensive, it's holistic, and that serves as your scholarship application. The times when there's a different application is like when Frank was talking about the Florida-Canada linkage is across all public universities of Florida. So that does have a separate application to complete. Um, all right. So there was a question about baseball. So I'd love, uh, I'm sure there's a number of student athletes here in the crowd. Please in the chat, feel free to shout out your sport if you're looking to go to the U.S. Um, for your sport. But maybe each of you could talk a little bit about um, what athletics are like on your campus. Um, and um, maybe a shout out to baseball if you have it uh, as well. I know uh, Mikhail, I believe Spellman does not part, yeah, does not have athletic program. So we'll go ahead and Scott, Frank, and uh, Laura can, can do this one. Frank, we'll start with you. So uh, Tony, I think Tony in the chat was giving me a hard time about the Rays not able to win a World Series. So our local Major League Baseball team is the Tampa Bay Rays, which actually play in St. Petersburg. I was a big Thing. that's where the stadium is and everything so they're in the same division as the Rays, so as are the as the jays so that's why uh i'm not a big fan of the jays but we uh, have lots of really good i'll tell you florida if you don't know florida florida in general whether it be a community college or a university we have be beautiful weather all year long so the sports are very competitive whether it's junior college or community college or university all sports really good i can tell you our baseball team uh, it's probably like 12 years ago, nine years ago, 10, nine, 12 years ago, they won the uh, World Series, actually. They're um, at, in the JUCO um, and uh, out in um, Grand Junction, Colorado. So they've been doing really, really well. Um, we usually have a lot of guys that, that play one or two years with us, and then they'll sign. So a lot of baseball players, that if you're interested in going to like the majors or getting, getting out there, you can go to a community college and put in one or two years and go right into the draft or get picked up. So that's a huge bonus. But I will say – the sports in Florida, whether it be our tennis team, which we have women's tennis, they're ranked top 10 in the U.S. every year in community colleges. Uh, but we have lots of international students on our baseball uh, teams. We have men's, women's softball. Actually, surprisingly, we have about five or six Canadian students that are going to be playing in the fall with our softball team, which is a huge change. We haven't really had a lot of Canadian students playing in general, usually like one out of our sports. So women's tennis, men's baseball, women's softball, Women's volleyball and women's basketball are our sports. And like I said, they are very good. And I can drop in a uh, link to the uh, sports page. So I can take a stab at it. I think it's going to be a, a little more disappointing to the sports enthusiasts uh, that are considering Kettering. Kettering actually doesn't have any NCAA affiliated sports at all. Our students are involved in the co-op program that I mentioned six months out of every year. Um, so they're working full time in many situations. And so it doesn't really um, cooperate with a sports training schedule very well. Having said that, there's a lot of athletes on campus, but they're all heavily involved in intramurals and club sports, uh, but nothing on a varsity level. UC Santa Cruz is an NCAA Division III um, school. So we have a number of excellent competitive teams Baseball is not one of them. Um, I did put a link into the chat of the, the sports that we have um, for the Division Three competitive teams. But we also have a ton of opportunities to get involved in sports, um, club sports. We have um, sports that are competitive and some that are just for fun. Uh, 
we have inner tube water polo um, where you can just uh, splash around and have fun. And we have tons of outdoor activities. If you're an outdoor recreation enthusiast, UC Santa Cruz is the place for you. Um, we are, it's like, basically it's like studying in the middle of a state park when you come to UC Santa Cruz. We have miles and miles of hiking trails. Um, we have all the water sports you can, you can want. So great a place if you're active, whether competitive or non-competitive. All right. Um, we finally, we've got now a flurry of questions coming through in the last few minutes. Two people just asked if you have American citizenship, um, how does that affect the application process? Um, I think probably one person could take this on. Is there someone who feels comfortable answering this question? Sure, I can, I can jump in. Um, okay, so, yeah, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, applicants uh, in, in, in those cases, they're going, they're going to apply as U U.S. citizens. Um, it won't, in many cases, it won't have a lot to do with their admission, um, but it may have something to do with certainly the immigration process could be, could be streamlined considerably for those students that are dual, dual citizens or U.S. citizens. And Mikhail, is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I'll just say um, it'll probably change the documents. So for us, for example, the TOEFL score um, and other information, so application documents that you may have to submit as a non-US citizen, that is where the checklist just might differ. So just pay attention to that, what you may or may not have to submit depending on your citizenship status. And the other piece of information is the FAFSA, right? So if you're applying for financial aid, American citizens can fill out um, the FAFSA, fafsa.gov for Americans. Um, so that's just another financial aid option. Uh, okay, so another question uh, about computer science. So this one's for Kettering and Newsros. Um, are there any, and actually, um, Mikhail, you have computer science as well, right? Um, okay, so let's go to everybody. What kind of minimum ac academic requirements would you need to be aware of? And so in, in Canada, oftentimes each major has a very specific requirement. So um, I know that's probably, you could probably speak more generally about what are the requirements to get into your different institutions. Um, let's start with Laura and, uh, and go from there. Yes, one thing that's very important to know about UC Santa Cruz is that computer science is our most selective major. That is the only major that you specifically must apply for as a first year student and be admitted for it. So um, in terms of the requirements, um, any student who graduates with a high school diploma and is eligible to attend university in their home country is eligible for admission at, UC, at um, the University of California. Uh, so we're looking for just a general qualification that will allow you to, to study in Canada. Um, we are a, a very selective university, so the average GPA of our first-year admits is 4.08. So we're looking for highly qualified students, um, strong GPA, as well as evidence of ability to contribute culturally to our campus. Um, so. Um, evidence of leadership, um, evidence of uh, involvement outside of the classroom as well. I can go next. For us, computer science, um, we don't have any requirements. So you apply to Spelman College as an institution. You get to choose your major. Um, so you just have to meet the admissions requirements that we set forth. We don't have any minimum requirements. We'll do an average profile. So we are also a selective university. So our average admitted GPA is a 3.9. If you submit test scores, a 1217 SAT or a 26 ACT, we are test optional for the next two years. But as in a whole, you just have to get admitted to Spelman and then you have until the first semester of your second year to declare that major. So you'll have some classes that you'll have to take regardless. So you have time to figure out, try a comp sci class, see if you like it. If you don't, you have time to figure out um, and pivot if you need to. Yeah, and just real quickly from Kettering's perspective, when you apply to Kettering, um, you're applying to the whole university. We don't have specific uh, breakdowns for, for majors. Um, because of the type of institution we are, we look primarily at math and laboratory sciences, um, problem solving skills on the high, in the high school curriculum. Um, so if we're, we can be, uh, for, for math and science, we're pretty stringent, but we might be a little bit more uh, forgiving when it comes to 
maybe a foreign language or maybe a history class that's uh, a little less focused on, on what we like to do. Just to kind of chime in, we're pretty easy. We're open access. So you just start at whatever level you want to come in at. So the great thing is, is uh, if you don't have SAT scores, it's fine. We have a placement test that we'll give students that is free that you can take from abroad. So you don't have to take it at a special testing center. You can take it from your home with a webcam or on campus when you arrive. So uh, it's open uh, access. And, um, you know, as far as the, uh, the same thing with all the degrees. So um, very, very easy. Yeah, and, and for that example of like computer science, um, somewhere like Silicon Valley, you can start with a two-year degree and then you can transfer to UC Santa Cruz at that more rigorous major. You know, if maybe your high school grades aren't as Do, as do your one year of OPT, right? You could do yep. your one year of OPT after you get your associates and then transfer to a um, university of choice. Absolutely. Um, so we are at time. So we are going to wrap up now. Here are all the email addresses of our um, of our panelists today. Please use the emojis to thank the panelists for their for their time that they gave to us. Um, there's there we go. Some loves and some claps. Um, thank you so much for your time. Also, um, lastly, with Education USA, we would love for you to follow us on social media. So if you are a Instagram user, um, here is our Instagram channel um, where you can follow Education USA and learn more about our upcoming events. Thanks again, everyone, and I hope you all have a good night. Any questions that were not answered during the session, we I will follow up afterwards. And you please email the admissions officers directly for questions you had about their schools. Good night, everybody.